Okay, now they got the cameras rolling. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Professor Orlowski here in the uh, Department of Architecture in the College of Architecture and Design. Uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Um, Catherine Darnstadt is founder and principal of Layton Design in Chicago, uh, which is a collaborative practice that focuses not just on design, but on the social impact of design. Uh, she's also a former director of the Chicago chapter of Architecture for Humanity. Uh, she holds a Bachelor of Architecture from Illinois Institute of Technology. Uh, since founding Layton Design in 2010, mm -hmm. correct? Um, she has received and her firm has received numerous recognitions, amongst them uh, uh, presentation and inclusion at the International uh, Biennale in Venice, Core 77 Design Awards, Ar Archetizer A Plus Awards, Chicago Ideas Week, and she's been featured, and they've been featured on NPR. She was the 2013 American Institute of Architects Young Architects Honor Award winner, and uh, in 2014 was named one of Crane's Chicago's 40 Under 40. Uh, in addition to her design practice, she also teaches at Northwestern University and has taught at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, on a personal note, I've had the pleasure of serving with Catherine on the board of the Association for Community Design. Uh, and uh, last year, Catherine, through just sheer force of will, uh, initiated one of the, I think, one of the most important things that the organization has done uh, which is the launch of our micro fellowships uh, to help place uh, emerging practitioners in practices uh, related to public interest design and design for the public good. So uh, her presentation tonight is entitled Tactical Leverage, and I'd like to invite you all to join me in welcoming Catherine Darnstadt. All right, thank you so much and, and for taking time out of your studies. I know how much more important studio is than listening to me. And so I appreciate that. Um, it, I'm five years of having my own practice, which I'll talk about in 10 years post-graduation out of architecture school. And so I'm technically a millennial, I'm a minority, I'm like this unicorn that apparently all these marketing studies want to get a hold of. And so that gets infused into the work and how the delivery of this goes. And, and very specifically, um, there's not going to be buildings in this presentation. I'm going to focus on smaller scale projects to show that small and large scale are not opposing ends of the spectrum, but that they're part of a continuum. And so I started my practice um, back in 2010, and as part of tonight, I want to share this. It's a very non-linear history of the two projects that I'm going to show, and hopefully it's in a humorous format, but that it doesn't undermine the serious consideration that I give to architecture on a daily basis. When given the choice between muse and messenger, I think muses have much better life expectancies, and that's one of the things that I embody in the work. I look at it as infotainment, and I think that also allows us to have a greater understanding and a greater audience whether when we just talk to ourselves versus talking to the general public. And I think that's part of the identity crisis that our industry is also in. And, it's, and what I'm showing and sharing is one way that we deal with that identity crisis. But we looked at the firm as a prototype. And we don't only make buildings, we make systems, and we also make future founders. Um, one of the things that I came up against is that you don't learn how to be a principal of your own firm until you become a principal of somebody else's firm. And it's not something that we teach within the academic environment of how to be a practitioner. And that's something that we need to also alter as well. And that's the little pieces that I do at the School of the Art Institute and Northwestern are practice focused as well as design focused. And it's infused with, within all of that. And our work at Layton Design, it, 
exists to explore the influence of architecture as small or as large as the context allows. And sometimes in that exploration of the largesse of architecture has taken us into a system scale that we've been wildly unprepared for, totally not qualified for, um, and <laughs> but it's been incredibly fun and knowledgeable because, oops, that's not what you're supposed to see. I'm trying to get this coordination going on. But here it is. So this is, this is our mission, right? Um, we strive to harness these invisible forces impacting a project. So that's the, late, that's the latent part. The latency of latent design is making the invisible visible through the process of design. That's how the name came. It's not Catherine Darnstead architecture and design. It's not something, it's not a, a namesake. It's something that speaks to a larger entity and the ability to be more anonymous um, with what we do and to give us with the, the embodiment of design versus architecture, it also lets us detach from buildings as the core product that we do. Um, we're still very spatial, but we, um, we wanted to look a little bit differently. So most often our work is described as this, working at the intersection of design and community development to create social, economic, and environmental impact. But as you saw before, I think it's really, it's, uh, it's tough shit. You know, to do all of that, it's not only tough shit to do because it's not your it's not your job, <laughs> you know, in many ways. Um, but it also is because that's what we hear the most from like, everyone we work with. Like, you're gonna do that? Okay, good luck. You know, um, and this this is kind of where we negotiate these boundaries between that. We have double speak and double entendres are very deep in our work. And the firm was founded out of necessity. It was something to know. It wasn't founded out of privilege. So to give you a background how 2010 started, this is the legit six-month startup story of latent design. Um, so month one, I was promoted at work. Month two, I was licensed. Month three, I got married. Month four, I got pregnant. Month five, I got laid off. Month six, I started latent design. It's a terrible, terrible business plan. So do not take any notes about that and don't do it. And, and there's things that because of that I still pay for day one mistakes still this day because there wasn't enough planning involved it was necessity but in the other way what caused that necessity caused me to do was create my own safety net create my own systems and learn how to make a practice and it took about a year and a half of having latent design before I stopped acting like an employee I started acting like a boss, and that started to suddenly shape what the mission of latent design is today and the types of projects that we pursue, because I was still acting like somebody else was going to tell me what to do, um, when all of a sudden I realized, no, it's all my, it's all my problem. Um, I have to do this, and I have to figure it out. And that's a, that was an interesting mental shift to come through. And so this started because, um, you know, in reality, and you know, metaphorically and in reality, I was really hungry. And so this is the first project that we went on. And, and in this image, you see, um, you see people patiently waiting for designer cupcakes on a cold winter day that we will be experiencing in like less than a month in Chicago. So you see that. And it's these extremes of access that infuse our work that we started to see the first time through the dichotomies of the food system. And with that, the second image is you see a very similar day, only about a week and a half apart, where you have fam families waiting patiently at a food pantry. And with that, we uh, were dealing in a situation in Chicago where about 400,000 people now, at that time, half a million, were living in food deserts. And we have an understanding about food access now, and we have a very knowledgeable foodie culture, not only in terms of delicious food on one sense, but where food is being sourced, how it's getting, and what's going on within that industrialized food system. So I think that's all part of the foodie term rather than just five-star meals. Um, but what this, what this did is it was a problem that w we were approached with by a client who said we wanted to create a solution to increase food access in food deserts, pro specifically fresh produce access, fresh produce access in food deserts across Chicago. So that was the brief. Like that, that, that was it. Um, and when they came to us, they had a white paper on 
on this, they had a year long white paper that was a deep study of food deserts and food access issues in Chicago, but they didn't have a name, they didn't have a brand, they didn't have an idea, they didn't have what ultimately they needed, which was a bus. And so with this, um, we ultimately created Fresh Moves Mobile Produce Market, and it's a mobile market inside a decommissioned transit authority bus that was that sought to restore fresh produce access in neighborhoods. So I led the design team for this, and it was my first experience with community-based participatory design um, and learning to leverage this collaborative design process in a, into a tool that build, built not only a spatial solution, a graphic solution, a design solution, but also advocacy, access, and empowerment. And most adorably, we tried to dissect complex social infrastructures over post-it notes. And I think I remember you know, that most notably, of like what are the tools that we're using and how are we talking about this versus actually prototyping in real life. And so with our client, with them, we worked with them every step of the way. That first, it was about a three year process from when they walked in the door and approached us to develop a team before this launch. Um, happened and it was actually the first winner of the Archetizer A plus awards was this particular project and I'll talk about that in a second but it's this prototype in real life that we were able to take a risk and since it wasn't a building it liberated us to go essentially embrace scope creep and go well beyond um, what we would typically do and design oh everything but the food and the public was generally impressed by the focus on the social aspects of food to build community and the project spawned numerous versions across the country. There was one in, De there's, was one in Detroit or there might still be, Boston, LA, um, Toronto, um, internationally. It's kind of, it's, it's built its own entity. And then the other thing it was, it won like all the awards, <laughs> you know? And that was something that for us, that for the design team to receive these awards from Architizer to, the, one of the first USDA grants to study the impact of mobile markets in both uh, rural and urban environments was huge. We never saw an impact, like a measurable um, qualitative impact of design was that was the first example of saying like, wow, we're actually, our client is getting a grant to actually study mobile markets and be that urban example across the board and, it, and for us it was looking at the rise of amateur as expert you know our clients are amateurs designers but they're experts in food access and then does that also um, possibly create the rise of expert as elitist because that's the other area where we were coming in and they approached us because they couldn't find other designers to work on a project like that and they particularly wanted to work with architects and a design team but they couldn't find it because no one was giving their project the time of day and so within this, this, this was very interesting, and I'll, I'll tell you something about how this project uh, transformed me in two ways. Uh, in Chicago, the AIA Chicago, about the same year this launched, they launched the Small Project Awards, and they still have, they had a category and still do called Small Objects. So it's an object um, broadly defined that was made for a price point of $50,000 or less. And we entered it because we're like, yeah, that bus took 30 grand. No one's going to show up with a bus. We're totally going to win this. And we lost to a chandelier. And that was really depressing. I was like, oh my gosh, because you have these moments where it's being well received on one side, but then your actual, your design community, which is your family essentially, is not acknowledging it at all. And in the middle at that time when it's like severe depression of like wondering, is this the right path for the firm? Are we doing the right thing? Does this even resonate? Is when we won the Architizer A Plus Award, which at that time, Architizer was coming online and trying to set itself apart as an architectural and design vanguard for the industry and they positioned themselves to being on that leading edge and so that was the validation again um, to see is like, okay, maybe the traditional, the AIA as the representative of the traditional architecture community might not necessarily get what we're doing or support it, um, but maybe this other guard of the architectural and design community absolutely does and wants to support it and wants to grow it. And for us then, for a team of folks who are just starting out who were 
most were unemployed at that time or marginally employed or not even in the same industry, that they, not in the architecture industry, for them then to turn around and turn in a resume and a portfolio with one project that had been in the Venice Biennale, Core 77, the First Lady's Book, the Architizer A Plus Award, that's huge. They set themselves apart from their peers and they were in another league at that point. So everyone on my design team ultimately was employed within six months of like the project completion at a firm that actually aligned more closely to what they wanted to do and their own personal mission. It's debatable if I'm employed yet or not. I don't know some days if I am. But the other thing that came from it was uh, this quote. Uh, this quote came from the core 70, one of the core 77 judges that said it's a beautiful project, but it might be too socio-political. And for me, the I read between the lines that policy and people should not be intertwined with design. And I think that's what we were butted up against and what we were trying to change and still trying to change within latent design is, of course, you can't have any project, any architectural project without it being socio-political. You can't get an FAR bonus or a zoning approval or a building, you know, a building permit without something being political. You don't have clients without the socio side of it. And for us to just read that, it was the resounding kind of like ignorance of, of the, the, what the current curators of the design field were looking at. And so, I mean, I, I feel to this day, you know, this, there's a class question that echoed really loudly there and who are we supposed to design for? And if it's already not seared onto your retinas, this diagram should be. It was one of the things in the most simple form that relays that our built environment um, has an inverse relationship between design and economy where the most amount of what we qualify as good design is reaching the least amount of people. And so you have that access is inverted to design, whereas at the same time within our industry, we have another inversion. So if you know the diagram on the left is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I'm sure at some point in time, someone in your studio has referenced this as not only what what we do at the core, at the base, we, we meet people's physiological needs of shelter, of place, of home. That's what we do. And that's how it was told to me in my studios. It's like what you do is the core of the existence of humanity and it helps people get to this Zen stage. But in our, you know, in our industry, we're super Zen as designers. We're like really smart, right? But we're not able to meet our own physiological needs because you're gonna stay up for five days straight, you know, and do your project, you know. You're like, you're going to get underpaid. You're not going to get paid overtime. So we're not meeting our own physiological needs as we're meeting other people. So we have to look at, at there's a piece that is broken within our design discipline that we also have to look at. And so it's about, it's about this time that I should probably say something nice. And you want to maybe hear something like, if you do what you love, you never work a day in your life. <laughs> or something along those lines. And I, I still want to hear those, those platitudes as well that make me feel good about what I'm doing. And the only thing that is the most comforting is knowing that there's a fine line between being crazy and being king. And we have a, a kind of a business climate and an entrepreneurship or innovation client climate in general in the world right now where we want the king all the time or the queen, you know. You want, you want that um, as a leader, you want them to be visionary and a game changer and that's what we support. But the thing is, is a king or a queen is made by their supporters, whereas crazy is when you have none of that. And so for us to actually go forward is we actually need to be more followers and more muses rather than geniuses. And because if we don't do that, we're all going to slowly go crazy if we're going to be continued to be taught and to act like we're the lone genius in the room. And so think about that. Are we, are we geniuses or are we the crazy one? And so that first project with Fresh Moves took about three years, like I said, from start to finish. And the next one that I'm looking at, like nothing happens fast. So like it, it could have happened fast if we only just sticked around, stuck around, sorry, for the, the two months that we did the hardcore design process and never learned anything from the front end or the back end. But then I don't think, then we wouldn't have learned anything. And it wouldn't have allowed us to take on another project like this 
which is um, currently at five years in the making, and it will be it will go on a little bit longer. So this is uh, the project is called Activate, and we are leading the entire placemaking initiative for the city of Chicago. We're developing it, we're implementing it over the next three years. We're in a public-private partnership with the city, and it's a huge risk for us to do that. But it's it's wildly uh, interesting again because at the core. I believe that quality of life is related to quality of space. I don't think there's anyone in the audience who would disagree with that at all. And in Chicago, much like here in, in Detroit and in Southfield, the city is rooted in its neighborhoods, its public spaces, its infrastructure, the individual identity that comes from you know, what block you live on is so unique to Chicago. And when neglected or inaccessible, these spaces, they're detrimental to neighborhood health, to vitality. And we always are looking at, and I saw projects today that are still looking at how do you transform these open spaces, these interst interstitial spaces to become something more, to be that community connectivity, to be that conduit um, that we want to, to occur. And so we created Activate, and, and it's, you know, at the core, we're looking at placemaking, right? And so my, my kind of five-year disagreement with placemaking is, is it, is it a verb? Is it a noun? Is it a brand? And what is difficult with this term and with this industry that's now around placemaking, because it is a business, um, is that it emphasizes the object over objectives. And with that, we, we see that you know, that's, that's, that's a, a flaw within that particular um, type of dialogue is because we're, we're all making objects, but we're not making systems. And for me, it looks at if there's not a process after the provocation of the object or the event, then these beautiful moments of you know, art, of tech, of design, they're, they're really not authentic because they're not actually making place. And to make place is about the stewardship that goes in it beforehand and after, and actually making a longer term system afterwards. And so with that, we, we started to look at what are the two going to be the main components of this program, because we got to be really self-critical about it if we're, going to, if we're going to develop what we think is going to be a more, um, a more replicable or more authentic stand on placemaking, especially within the city that I live and I work in with the clients that I know and I love. Um, we looked at two main pieces, uh, or three actually. We have temporary public art, and so we looked at, can we start to take and decentralize these curators of culture by bringing arts into and uh, into deeper into the neighborhoods and out of the central loop? All of our major art institutions are in the loop area around Millennium Park, and we have a couple neighborhood-based institutions, and the re uh, everyone else can you know suck it. Um, so very simply, is that like, how do we kind of create this partnership? between the institutions and the neighborhoods and use public space as that platform for it. So this is the Joffrey Ballet performing, uh, their team performers. And so pre prior to this, one of the biggest risks that we took out of this program was actually just making things easier. And I shit you not how we won the RFP is we went in and roughly said over the 120 pages that we had to submit um, was what if we just made things easy and legal that you want to do? <laughs> you know, like, that's it. And so for this, if you wanted to have, this was a 90-minute performance on a public plaza before we went in and, and changed things around with our contract and the municipal code, you would have to fill out a 30-page permit, and then you would have to submit it 45 days in advance for the 90-minute 90 90 day, 90 performance. So you're probably spending six to eight hours for 90 minutes, and then you're gonna pay a, a ridiculous fee on top of that. And so even if you wanted to, first you didn't, wouldn't know where to access that information because getting through city permits and codes and departments is cloudy at best. And then are you going to actually spend the time and, and be able to pull something off and execute it? And a lot of community organizations do want to do that, and they want to, but they've been so deterred by previous interactions with the city that they weren't doing it. So if there was any nascent energies around a site, they were being quashed pretty quickly. The other thing we looked at is there's a real cost factor to what spaces get and don't get and what they have and don't have. And so we wanted to also start to break down barriers to access by 
breaking down bar the cost barriers. And so we're looking at rapid prototype design systems for pre-approved and cost-effective public space amenities for communities to select. What I mean by that is that we started as simple as a bench. So the typical um, metal bench that goes in a lot of the parks in the city, um, they're about $1,200 to install, which is ridiculous. And so we looked at our own construction uh, waste that we have within the industry, which has a huge issue with construction waste. And we went and approached um, one of the concrete plants that we have in Chicago and those companies, and they're going to be making prototype benches out of the excess concrete that goes back to the plant that they normally just put up, put together in, you know, um, like barriers otherwise, and they said for free, if you could pick it up, we'll put it in whatever molds you bring us. And that's a huge change to all of a sudden go from, well, if you want a bench, you have to figure out, you have to find $1,200 and find a city approved contractor to now, well, if you could, we could get one made for little to no cost and we just have to find a contractor to pick it up and put it on the site. Because the other thing that improved access to getting these amenities on the site is latent design, not only are we an architecture firm, but then we're also contractors as well. And we did that because of this contract specifically with the city. The reason I did that is, we could make anything that we want, you know, um, in a warehouse, but the moment we bolted to city property, you had to have a license and pre-approved GC, you had to meet women and minority um, protocols and requirements, and it just seemed absolutely ridiculous that I would have to hire someone to do what I know how to do and that looks like me. So it was very easy in the city of Chicago. It's frighteningly easy to get a, a, con a general contractor's permit. You would just sent in some money, filled out a form, sent in some money, showed insurance, and, G and a license showed up two weeks later. So it was, and, and then our, now how we use that, um, we design and build our own projects um, at a very small scale. So our interior fit out, some of our residential work, um, we do that ourselves. So we actually are tacking back in the architectural realm, back to this kind of glorified master builder by being able to internalize all our projects and then we could take risk with the contractors that we hire. So when we want to think about what a social enterprise is, some of our contractors are, um, you know, are returning vets. Some of them are ex-offenders. And if we want to talk about at the core, design creates great spaces, but we really have to also get design to create local jobs. And if our if no one's able to take that risk, we could at least show the quality of work and push the quality of work with design teams and, and individuals that normally aren't getting um, brought to the table for one reason or another. But that was a little bit of a tangent, so I apologize on that. Um, and so we, we, we got the contract not only because I think we had a lot of common sense in it, we weren't promising a lot of things. We worked with what the city gave us and said we can't bring any more because we're not anyone. You know, we don't have, don't, we don't have family in politics. I don't have like a trust fund. I don't have, you know, I'm not a global corporation. I'm a benefit corporation, and we have a dual um, definition of equity, both social and financial equity. But otherwise, than that, we know how to we know how to manifest things, and we know actually how to work with our neighbors and in the communities, and we have been doing that because we built on five years of history for this particular program. So for us, um, it was, it, over time, it, it was that we felt the voice of the city wasn't being heard. And that was resonating with some of our clients at the smaller scale, but it felt that the vice of the city is what was being sold. You know, I, we work in some of the most, quote unquote, most dangerous neighborhoods in Chicago. And it was like, that's not what we see. Yes, there is violence, but that the core of that's the 1%. The that's the other version of the 1%. It's the 1% of people who are actually creating the violence and not the 99 that are trying to repair it. And so if we wanted to change this story, we had to change the storyteller and that's how this program started because spaces are as profound as we allow them to be. I know it doesn't have to look like architecture, it doesn't have to last forever, and it's these experiences that create our collective memory overall. And this is how it started. If you remember the slide that had Activate on it a couple slides ago, this is the result of the first time we actually did our first Activate project. So it was back in 2010. 
I led a team that developed an international design competition, then called Activate Public Space Design Competition. We're terrible at naming stuff, mind you. So, um, but anyway, that's what it was called. It was really catchy. Um, and what what the design brief did, it sought to address the needs of this uh, of this one vacant site. We had a client that came to us and said, "Hey, we have these two vacant lots that are covered with concrete that used to be a parking lot. Can you help? Can you design something for?" And we said, "Yeah, absolutely. We could design something for." It, but we have another client that has a one lot and another one that has five, and then the city of Chicago has 10,000. So, I mean, we can't design 10,000 objects, but we can design a system. And so we use the, the design competition as the vehicle to test out this system. The brief in the design competition was transform this public space, make it universally accessible, age inclusive, with an installation that costs $1,000 and would last one year. Like all the seasons, a thousand bucks was all we had. And we wanted to, to kind of use this to be the catalyst, to create the dialogue of open space, and to start to facilitate community engagement. Those are the big goals, and then the more specific parameters are a thousand bucks as a, and a year. And the winning designer was a Barcelona and Chicago collaborative that created this undulating landscape on an otherwise flat site. Did it through using plywood. I mean, those are the those are the holy grail of placemaking, right? You don't even have to leave the letter P. Plywood, paint, plants, you're good. You're a placemaker. Um, and so they created this undulating landscape in a modular format that could expand and contract depending on the site and also depending on the budget. And then because, of course, you know, you paint it red because that's what you do. And what I love about this photo is the two individuals in the foreground, they're the only actual, actual volunteers that you see on the site. During this one day installation, everyone in the background, this is old school networking happening, is somebody got off the bus at the end of the corner, walked home, saw something red, grabbed some friends, came back, they called some other friends, came back. And so it started to actually create a community space and already a dead space. People helped us paint, they helped us cut, they helped us plan. But out of this photo, everyone in the background is just, just there. They just came for the event that we didn't plan. And it's that network and that same exact site, um, within six months of the in installation, the community rallied and raised over $100,000 and the legal rights to transform the lots into a public space and a play lot, which is what it is today. We ended up getting all the material donated. We got twice as much material donated as we needed for that installation, for that temporary installation. So is this a $0 lot? Is it a $1,000 lot? Is it a $100,000 lot? I mean, what's the price tag that you put on something like that, and how do you actually qualify that? And when we've been studying this, it's now this productive landscape. It's a safe haven. It has an incubator of food business. It's a cornerstone of neighborhood identity. And in the five years since it's been installed, we've had eight new public spaces created out of that Activate program two new businesses that came out of there, so two food and gardening-based businesses that are local businesses that work on the site and other sites, and then one new non-for-profit that spurred out of that. So that's, you know, for, for zero dollars in a day of work, that's what comes out of it, and that's what we look at. And, and it set the precedence because in Chicago, we, and you know, here as well, you have vacant lots are the horizon line, you know, in most, in many of the neighborhoods, but they don't have to be the baseline. You know, they don't have to be what, what is thought, what, what is thought of as the core of community. So it's something that we can change. And so this program developed an urban design system that created opportunities for impact and moved this grassroots model into a for-profit economic driver. And we see that today and on other sites. And so by bringing this emotional connection to the sites through the project, we saw, and it actually highlighted how these informal systems highlight how poorly our formal systems are working. You know, so think about that. If we could do this out of, uh, you know, what it started as $1,000 and create new businesses out of that, what it, what's the small business department of the city doing? You know, what's the local chamber of commerce? How are they doing that? And how could this become um, part of a, maybe a formalized system? And so the growth of this competition was part of the baseline that allowed us to win the RFP when the city, the placemaking RFP when it came out. And so now we're working on about 50 sites in half of the neighborhoods across the city. So this is a scale and partnerships now. We went from working on 
privately owned sites and lots to publicly owned lots and now publicly owned plazas with the city as well. And so it's that scale, that growth of that business. And we're working specifically with the Department of Transportation. They're the main landowners. That's the department that's the main landowners of the plazas within the city of Chicago. And we're bringing this across the city of Chicago. So to kind of give you a scale, it's about 12 acres of neighborhood space. So this is a figure ground of the most um, well-known spaces from left to right. You have Millennium Park at 24 acres, Maggie Daly Park at 28, Lucas Museum, um, the Obama Le Library, where I think it should go, not where, I don't know if we're, he's gonna select Washington Park or not, but it should go in Washington Park. Um, river Walk, our thin little River Walk, Northerly Island, and then all of the plaza sites of Activate Chicago. So a bunch of triangles and squares and odd shaped sites. What you're seeing here is that, um, and what we know is we're bringing more public space to online than both the Obama Center and the Lucas Museum combined. So they're each bringing five acres a piece of new public space, we're bringing 12. And so that's a fact that was, for us, was really powerful to start to look at that. And then we started thinking, is like, okay, so how are we dealing with that? If, you know, the little individual plazas aren't impressive, maybe we could start to, um, you know, make it a little bit more abstract or for the spatially challenge, find out when the sites are rationalized, how much money is really going into them. And so the black dot in the middle represents um, the, the square footage and then the blue is representing the money that has gone into those particular sites. So again, left to right, Millennium Park gets about $450 a square foot. Maggie Daly got um, $45 a square foot. Lucas Museum, based on what the estimates are so far, is going to get about $540 a square foot. Uh, Obama Library, based on an aggregate of previous presidential libraries and centers, is going to get about $1,100 a square foot. River Walk got $1,100 a square foot. Northerly Island, because it's mostly um, a natural habitat, it's not It's not as pr heavily programmed as the other. That got $2.40, and then the public space project and the public space funding that the city has provided, not only as part of our program, but in the last three years before the program, comes out to about nine cents a square foot. So this is, this is, this is challenging because, you know, Back at home, some people would tell me like, well, I could have told you the city doesn't give a dime about the west side or the south side of the city, but we actually can see it through the open data that we had available to us. And what that, what that did for us is to look at why that is happening. And first, there's a park, there's park advocacy, but there's not public space advocacy. And then in general, there might not be an understanding of the difference between park space and public space. And so that's something that we have to create, not only that awareness, but the advocacy and then the funding around it. So it's not necessarily, I'm not trying to get to $500 a square foot, I'm just trying to get to a dollar. So it's not a rational, economics, it's like two pocketomics. It's super hustling that you have to go through to go from a nine cents to a dollar to do this program. And how we do that is we all of a sudden became um, civic innovators and we became policy wonks at it. So, you know, this is a diagram of how this all comes to be and where we created a unique space for us. Because going through a contract with the city, we built on not only what existing ordinances were in place, we had to figure out how do things actually happen? How does Lollapalooza happen? How does, you know, the NFL draft happen? How are you generating revenue for something? So we read a ton of documents and then carved out a space for us in the center that allowed us to do the things that we wanted to do. Because again, we just wanted to make things that like San Francisco and New York were doing legal in Chicago. I mean, we were not inventing anything new, really. We're not pushing this envelope, but it felt like we were. Because we're trying to make place as a platform and we are currently seeking out mutually beneficial partnerships with individuals and organizations in these key areas. So when we don't think of place as objects, of benches, of trees, of lighting, which are the qualities of space that we find desirable, what are the potentials of space that we want to happen? And so what does, how does a space and place impact arts and culture or increase health and wellness or look at social equity or increase tech and data or also you know, help build entrepreneurship and small businesses in the neighborhood. And that's what we're looking at. So 
Uh, from arts and culture, we've already commissioned and installed our first public art piece, which was wildly fascinating and fun to do. Um, health and wellness, working with Blue Cross Blue Shield and other partners to um, bring programming onto the sites for youth and neighbors. Social equity, really looking at who builds and who makes our spaces. How are we decentralizing the design culture <clears throat> and the design industry? Tech and data, working with partners to actually put up data sensors in the sites that we could understand and track, you know, how many pedestrians are going there, what's the sound quality, what's the air quality, and then take that raw data and start to understand our urban environments more. And then entrepreneurship, how do we actually build business and, you know, and, and increase um, the identity of neighborhoods by increasing the availability of existing businesses. And we do that and, you know, we always have to, um, quantify it as well. And so the other thing that we did is we started to look at what design priorities are. Not necessarily design priorities of placemaking, those are well documented by other institutions, but we really wanted to be Chicago-centric on it since we're working um, across the city. And so one summer, um, an employee who doesn't work with me, and I hope it's not because of this, I had, we jointly read almost every uh, paper that came out of the city. So from the pedestrian plan to the cultural plan to the um, coalition to lower obesity in Chicago's children to the Green and Healthy Neighborhoods Plan. We read them all across all the departments and found seven priority areas that we want to look at, engagement, education, economics, you know, culture, policy, health, and transit. And then now are tying it back to the specific priorities, recommendations that are coming out of each of those plans. So when we go back and talk, and we did this not only for the program, but we did it for all of our projects. Um, firm wide. So when we go to a client and work with a client, we're saying, well, you're building, sure, it's doing X, Y, and Z, which is what your program is asking for, but did you also know it's meeting recommendation 14 of the Green and Healthy Neighborhoods Plan or priority area one of the Arts and Cultural Plan or, you know, position 14 of, you know, Blue Cross's Blue Shields um, priority list. And, you know, frustratingly, none of those documents share any of the same language. So it, toggles between recommendations, priorities, strategies all across the board. But now that also, that information gives our clients a much more powerful position to be in when they talk about why their project is needed. Their project is, an, is needed, of course, because of what, it, what they want it to do, but now it, the city actually needs it, needs it and it makes an undeniable case um, for that. So, we talked about, I, I mentioned entrepreneurship and small business, and this is the particular sub-project, you know, I met, uh, that came out of, is coming out of the Activate program. I mentioned the three kind of key areas of this program, the public arts and culture, the uh, material, construction material reuse for rapid prototyping objects on sites, and then this is also the other one is micro-retail. And we wrote um, new policy to allow for these micro-retail structures on public spaces that bridge the capital gap between startup and storefront that stopped many entrepreneurs from growth. I realized that this was an area of concern because in the previous five years I had worked on com commercial corridor plans, community revitalization plans, where you're looking at what do we do with these vacant storefronts? How do they become vacant? How do we bring, put more businesses in them? What's the, what's the overwhelming factors? And it's not necessarily you need a new design solution. You don't need something in the window. You need programming, but then you also need to change how the commercial real estate environment is working. And when you understand how small businesses operate, that it's a difficult leap to put up to sign a three-year lease, that's a big commitment. We're all commitment phobes. We don't need spaces as large. Inventory is growing smaller, it's growing digital, it's growing, growing in a third place. And how small businesses operate might be on more of a festival or nomadic retail schedule rather than a permanent bricks and mortar location. So coupling those two together, it's really difficult to rent out a 1,500 square foot storefront because it's too big for many clients that might want it, but too small for the ones that are actually going to use it. And so you get this gap in what you're commercial corridor starts to look like. And so with that, we, we decided, well, we also want to challenge ourselves to look at a couple other things of like, what if we, um, what if we brought the idea of concessions to public spaces? Because we were working on some sites that were already 
you know, would be qualified as activated by um, an organization. You know, it would have trees, it would have paving, it would be on a busy corridor, would have art, but no one's actually going there. So what's the missing piece? If no one's going there, we have to figure what, out what that is. So with the boombox micro retail, we also, we, that was our, our hypothesis that you needed this extra component of commerce. And then we also did it to, to challenge ourselves of, well, what it, what the hell can you actually do with shipping containers? Because it seems like everyone wants to do something with it. What what can we've never worked with one? I per personally kind of hate them. Um, what what like let's use one. Let's make ourselves use one. And we didn't want to, but ultimately, um, our contractor came back to us and for the design that we had, which you see kind of this design in the background. It's it's roughly the same size. It's about 200 square feet. Um, he's like, well, let's think about this. If we're going to construct it in a warehouse and then bring it to the site, the cost of us to actually weld a, a structure together that can be transported versus just using a shipping container, which is already prefabbed and has a structural capacity greater than what we could probably put together for the same price point, let's try it. Let's use it. And so for us, we put the two of them together and kind of merged our design um, together uh, to create this. And so I'm going to hopefully get this all to work. It's a short video. Sorry about that, you guys can do the rest of the presentation. So I found out the only way I like shipping containers is that I take them completely apart. Um, and so in here, you can't tell anymore. And that was also part of the challenge is when we're doing research and looking at case studies of how people are using shipping containers, we're not, we're seeing, we're seeing the aesthetic, that corrugated aesthetic is being highlighted. And, and, you know, that was an aesthetic that we did not like. So what if we took that apart and did something different with it and used the structural capacity of the container? How far apart can we actually take it? So we cut off all four sides. We kept the floor, built up the floor. We kept the ceiling. Um, and built that down. And by doing that, we then, um, I guess, we supersize the corrugations and have this faceted facade around the perimeter that is done in a way that you could put adjustable shelves in it so that product, so the retailers can display their product outside of the footprint of the shipping container so that you have, you want to be able to use maximum amount of depth within the space. Because when you only have an eight foot overall, you really have seven, eight on the interior clear. Then you have to build up all of your walls because it has to be insulated, because it's a year-round thing, unless you want to suffocate or freeze, depending on your season. So then all of a sudden, you go to seven-foot clear. You put a display in there that takes up two feet. And now you're at a five-foot clear. And now someone's just walking in and walking out. You can't actually have it. Like, you can't have an event. You can't use it as a space. Um, we decided we wanted to use a bifold door, which um, you know, we had a really tight price point, so we had to decide, you, like everything, if you have three things you like, you can only pick two of them. Um, so we went with the bifold doors and heat and AC. So those are two things we couldn't live without because we wanted this also to be a stage and to spill out on the plazas themselves and allow people to use them. 
So our facade and our, our cladding material had to change. And what you're seeing is a very, very happy accident. Um, we used hardy board, good old hardy board, cement board. It's really boring and ugly. And this is actually the backside of the hardy board that we ordered. And through the dyeing process itself, it bled through to the back. And we found that this was much more interesting for us to look at both visually. The watercolor effect softens those hard angles. And it people don't know what it actually is. It makes it feel a lot more luxurious as an object than if we just had the single color of the original, of the, the right, the correct side of the hardy board up. And so for 200 square feet, that's what this is. It was about 12 months of negotiations with six different departments, uh, three new municipal ordinances that I had to write because the structure didn't exist um, in the code book. So we had to make a new municipal code to allow the structure for exist. So that's called a temporary vendor structure. And each one of those three words, temporary vendor structure was about each word had like a week of meetings just associated with it roughly. Temporary versus mobile, vendor versus retail versus concession, structure versus tent versus kiosk versus concession stand. All of those have implications um, that are comical really. And, and in the end, how we did this and how we approached this is we looked at the gray areas that exist within those six different unique departments. And we found little little loopholes, I guess. It's not, it, yeah, it's little loopholes. So the reason why it, the new code allows us to build under 400 square feet or less, because that's uh, an, accessory an accessory structure um, within the code. So we went, all right, 399 square feet or less is that's what our boom box is going to be. And then the height is 14 feet or less, because that's what garages and secondary structures get allowed. Um, we also worked with, so we had to convince building department it wasn't building, a building. We had to convince zoning department that they didn't need to zone it because it's on public property, so it's not a zoning issue. It deals with the public right away. It's a sidewalk. We had to convince um, uh, business affairs and consumer protection who deals with the regulation of the business licenses that are going in that it was a truck so that they could license it under an itinerant merchant license for all the businesses. We, and then we had to um, convince CDOT uh, transportation that it, it was part, it, you know, it was a structure and that could, they could they could put under what their purview is because transportation doesn't deal with buildings. So we also had to kind of convince them that it is a building and it's not. And then we had to con convince ComEd that it was a building so that they would hook up electrical to it. Um, so depending on who I was talking to, I could either like royally screw myself if I forgot what that narrative is. Um, we went through one mayoral runoff, which put us about four months behind schedule. We were supposed to open at the beginning of the season, and with the mayoral runoff, we couldn't actually introduce any of the ordinances that we wanted the council to pass, so it opened only about a month ago at the end of the season, which is a perfect time to test out the heat. Um, but. Um, in the end, what was really great is we did we did a really good job at that. Like we're good policy wonks all of a sudden, I guess, and we got zero permits to the point where everyone's like everyone signed off because it, we showed it wasn't their responsibility, you know, in some way. So everyone signed off, so no one would issue us a permit. So we actually, in the end, like that freaked me out. I was like, I cannot build, I can't like put a thing on a, a site without a permit. Like I don't know how to operate in that like free zone all of a sudden. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't handle the Switzerland that I made. Um, and so we, ended, I, I, we have a permit that just allows um, the temporary vendor structure to exist indefinitely as part of a public right away permit, the same permit that you get for like barricades. So that's, like, that's the permit that we ended up agreeing on that we needed. So it's, it's framed inside there um, in case anyone asks. And so that's a, so that that's what it takes to do something as anticlimactic as a 200 square foot shipping container. I found out over the course of a year why we weren't we, why we didn't have one in Chicago, and th that was the reason why is because we have a really convoluted um, regulatory structure, probably not different than any other city. I'm sure you know what what's going on in Southfield and Detroit is probably pretty convoluted in their own ways, um, but that was what it took because I know how to make buildings. I don't know how to make the built environment. And I was interested through that exercise and I found out how to, how to make the built environment. And that's a, a, a radical shift mentally for me and then also for the position of the firm and how we want to take it. And so in closing, I think design is a foil 
that reflects these, you know, of course, latent factors of influence on our built environment. It's our zoning, it's our policy, it's our funding, our ethos, and it's ultimately our will. I mean, this goes through, and I joke with people, but it went through because I'm very stubborn and I have a good lawyer. I mean, those are the two things that made something like this happen. And then the other thing is just an understanding that when you hear no, it's not because, well, sometimes it could be because it's a bad project, but no is sometimes why or how or what. It's an opportunity to go back and to test and to refine and to prototype and come back and find either the same audience with a revised version of your proposal or a new audience. So it's never a closed door. And to be able to take advantage of this foil that design can provide us with, we have to apply integrative thinking to all of our planning and policy models. And you know, as, as written here, it's to take things personal because this is not a job. You know, you're not becoming one of only 100,000 architects in the nation, which are the, a tiny, tiny majority, minority of people in you know, the professional realm. You're not doing this because you're gonna get paid really well. You're doing it because you do take it personal already. And so I do this because I'm a citizen in and a designer of cities, and I do it because it's simply what we must do to make the built environment that we're all staying up late right now in school designing that we wanna do when we're in our professional practice and that we wanna actually live in as well. And so with that, it's not tactical urbanism, it's tactical leverage. And that's ultimately what I see our firm as being uniquely skilled to do because we understand how to build the environment and not just buildings. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Catherine. We have time for a few questions. Uh, if anyone has a question for Catherine, just raise your hand. I'll bring the microphone to you so it gets recorded. Kurt. I'm doing my Oprah thing coming over. You get a question and you get a question. And you get a question. Hey, Catherine. Hi, Kurt. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Uh, I always ask questions. Um, I guess the, the first one, well, just be one question. I'll leave it at one. Let other people kind of get inspired. Your point on the nine cents a square foot, yeah. right? And then comparing it to, you know, the, from what I know, uh, $1,000 a square foot would be a fantastic budget oh, yeah. to have. Yeah. Uh, I mean, beyond fantastic. When you have something like that, a nine cents a square foot, but then the impact of the acreage, the space that you're uh, working with, you know, especially when you're navigating through policy and, you know, the, the city offices and things like that. Did you ever, well, first of all, did you have, did, did people have points where they didn't take you seriously? Even though you won the RFP, but I mean, to me, you know, throwing $50,000 at something seemed like, well, we have $50,000. But then, you know, that nine cents a square foot now is the, the proof to the point that your earlier point on the, the, the inverse relationship between design mm -hmm. and the economy mm -hmm. and, and how uh, the importance of what design can do. So did you have points along the way that, that you know, for, for everyone in the room here, especially the students, you know, coming out of school, you know, did you have points where people didn't take you seriously, but then you, you know, sort of powered through and then, or was that not even an issue at all? I all guess? the time. Um, I re regularly feel like no one takes me seriously. Um, but with part of that, it also required me to change how I was talking to people because I, I didn't know how to talk to the departments. I honestly didn't. I mean, I only know how to work with buildings and zoning and that's more of an adversarial position of like, why are you giving me a permit correction when I know like this is to code? It's a very different relationship. So I had to go from an adversarial mindset to a collaborative mindset. And then I had to understand that, that frankly, and it's okay um, that the cultural affairs department doesn't really care as much about health and wellness. So to talk about that as part of the pitch, I had to actually narrow the pitches, essentially, and narrow the discussion more so. Because when I talked about the overarching um, objective 
of this, if I talked about the macro, I would lose people who were only focused on the micro. And if I talked about the macro, it would actually be more difficult to get things done because people would see um, positions and opportunities for you know, barriers or, or regulatory um, oversight that it might not exist. So it wasn't until, so we talked about it about a, as a very small thing. I talked about it as benches. I talked about it as this. You know, I talked about it as you know, a shipping container. I didn't talk about some of the bigger ramifications of what I saw, what was possible, and what our partners in the city saw was, were possible. So we all had to get on you know, our talking points, essentially, like very literal internal talking points and then like even media talking points. And I've never been FOIA'd in my life, but now we're getting FOIA'd, like just because that's just what happens. And so when that, um, within that, it, it's, it's hard because it's another, it's a startup again. And I didn't realize, and I didn't look at this as an urban design startup. And if I did look at that in that way, I probably wouldn't have taken you know, I w even if we wanted, I probably wouldn't have accepted because it's very depressing to have a startup. I already had one five years ago when I started my firm and now I have another one and I didn't think about it that way. And it's just, it's a lot of no, it's really hard. And then we're pitching to investors, to equity investors and venture capitalists and people in the tech and civic innovation sector. And you hear no's and you hear good questions and things that we didn't even consider. Um, and that's all part of our not expansion of our knowledge of what we need to do, but it's something that I didn't ever realize was was it is related to architecture and it is related to how you develop projects. And I was just never part of that either in firms or I didn't have firm work, wasn't working at firms that do this regularly um, or have that as part of their component. If I worked for a developer, I might have understood this a little bit more and savvy. Um, just for a side note, I would say the best description of what our business model is now is a turducken. So um, I have an architecture firm that has a, a, a citywide initiative inside that, and within inside that citywide initiative, we have a product of the micro retail that has its own trajectory. So it's a turducken um, is the only way. I think I think um, I think that like. I think Stanford um, is going to review that or something. No. <laughs> but that, that's, the, that's the closest analogy that I have to how, how we're working and then the ability to, yeah, you know, somebody's going to say no all the time. And, you know, architects are readily I'll hear that a lot. Our clients say no all the time to us, too. So the no part isn't a big deal. It was everything else that it took to build the system that I didn't know and I was very naive as to how much power design and architects do have and how when where we're where we're just choosing to ignore the skills um, to kind of invert the power structure that we have not only within our own industry but then within the built environment itself. Another question? Ah, Margaret. as fast as you'll ever see me move <laughs> with no thing or no one chasing me. Yeah, so um, it was a bit late, but it was a, a fabulous presentation and uh, stand in awe of everything that you've been able to accomplish in uh, here five years. So uh, this idea of a startup and then also the recognition that you are making these tactical um, intersections with existing systems. So. In the process of getting the boombox project off the ground and realized, did you see any evidence that you have actually changed existing systems? Like you saw people go like, oh my gosh, uh, different departments should be working together differently. Do you mm -hmm. think you'll have longer term systemic impact than the little boombox project in and of itself, which is great? Yeah, I do. I think we're we're that's what we're planning. So we're two we're three months into the program launch, one month into the boombox launch within that program, and then we have a three year contract with the city. So from day one, we're thinking about that handoff because we're essentially the pilot and the prototype project to say yes, you should keep all of the items that we um, have implemented in the three years. You should keep them going on and this is how they benefit communities and businesses and everything else and you department leaders um, should find the way to continue to make that happen. Don't think of this as an additional task. Think of this as an integral piece of how you actually want to grow your core missions in each department. And so by doing that, it's ultimately you find the right people 
And so I just hope that they stay for three more years <laughs> within the city departments. And I also think that there's going to, um, we have a rise of civic innovation within the city as, as well and just understanding what outside collaborations and internal collaborations can do to streamline processes. So I think that conversation is only going to continue to grow more robust and we could be part of growing that conversation and then show examples of what comes out of it. Because frankly, when, you know, one, one great example, and I'll totally throw the council person under the bus, um, we, we, the ward, so each ward has a different council person, an alderman, it's called an alderman. We don't have actually the term alder woman, like, anywhere, but there's alder women too. Um, aldermen uh, for the area where the boom box is, like, wouldn't meet with us, like, didn't care, wouldn't meet with us, nothing like that. Uh, so we, we had to get a sign off to actually put it on. It was like a day before we're going to do it, and we're like, we just are like in his office, we're like, hey, we're gonna put this here. He's like, oh, okay, that's fine. And then, you know, when the ribbon cutting came, he said, oh, I'm not going to be available, I'm not going to be available. And we're like, well, the mayor and his wife are going to be there, and, like, you should probably show up. And, like, of course, he magically opened up his schedule and was there and was like, oh, I've supported this from the beginning. <laughs> like, this is so great for the neighborhood and all these things. And it's just like, you want, you, like, if given a, give, if I had the microphone at that time when that was happening, I probably would have said something else. But... You know, that's the kind of thing you have to walk into as well. And it's, it's, I'm trying to understand how to deal with design ownership and, and acknowledging the hard work that our team put into this, but then also letting people feel that they were a part of it and take their own ownership because it might be beneficial for us to leverage later. So, you know, there is, oh, we have, we have a running list of quotes from the mayor and different folks and, and, you know, from the treasurer and different folks in the city. And we use that and we use that as part of our pitches. You know, remember when you said that neighborhoods are the backbone of the city? Well, here's how you create more businesses or how you create better neighborhoods. Or you said you're going to invest here or make, you know, expand the cultural plan here. You said it. This is how we're doing it. So it's now a yes or a no question. Are you going to back it? Are you going to back what you said and what we were essentially given the task to do for you? So um, you started your business uh, or the firm in 2010. Correct. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to make an assumption that that was related to, the timing was related to the economic yeah. turn down. Mm -hmm. So um, I was hoping that you could speak just a little bit, particularly to the students here, about how traditional modes of practice as defined by, say, the AIA is very, very, uh, very much impacted by the ups and downs of the economy, particularly the building uh, industry. And many that are in our field benefit from that, but then when it turns down, there, it's almost like there's, a, maybe it's my impression, but a willingness to become a victim of that mm -hmm. and clearly you were not so you you started your own firm and kind of redefined what practice was within your skill set and can you talk about being proactive in defining what practice is to be resilient to these ups and downs yeah and I don't know if it's necessarily going to be resilient or not because I started at the bottom so there's only one way to go at that point um, and I think what it was was carving out a niche of the type of work that I wanted to do. And I was only seeing it in non-for-profit practices or volunteerism. And I was like, why aren't we doing this more within architectural practice? And I'm like, well, maybe I'll eventually find out because you don't make any money or something like that. But I also was in a climate where I had to figure out what to do. It was like every day is like I have to figure out how to make 500 bucks today, you know, because that's how much is going to need, you know, every day has a calculation of how much income you should have in every week and every month to pay your bills, your mortgage, all of this. And if you're making that from scratch and you're very closely tied to it, um, you see different opportunities. And, and like I said, it's the opportunities out of necessity versus out of the planning of it. Um, I think what was what was seductive for me is some of those early projects like Fresh Moves, where it was the first time where I'm working on project teams that are all women or all minorities, and it's individuals that look like me, that have similar backgrounds as, as I do, and that's very different than the firms that I was already in, and frankly, the architectural industry currently right now. And so for that, it's like, well, how can I still continue to be in this area as well? That served me well in some ways. So many of, half of our clients are nonprofits and community organizations. The other half are now kind of mission-driven 
private clients that we meet in, you know, within one degree of separation from the non-for-profits, but many of our clients are, and non-for-profits are run by women, you know, run by individuals of color, and so they are also starting to look at, like, let's, let's look and support individuals within our own community. And what's been interesting over the past year is we've been brought on a, as part of private RFPs for larger projects like tech corporation headquarters and things like that where we like don't have the experience for in our portfolio but the way we were getting brought in is instead of from the executive team which is picking you know a Gensler or something along those lines it's the it's the people who are directing the company's um, corporate social responsibility or social innovation programs that are saying hey this is a purchase and it should align with our values and our mission so we should look for something that has the same social equity that we that is the defining factors of why we have compostable plates or like that so we should be purchasing design services and design services with a social mission that aligns with ours and so that's how we two projects were that's how we were brought in and it was shocking that it wasn't it wasn't the CEO or the operating officer. Um, it was the director of social innovation that brought us in, and we lost both of them because, like in the end, like we have great ideas, but we don't have 22 tech headquarters in our portfolio. But to be part of that conversation was a, a huge opportunity to start to reposition how we want to be within the industry and see where competition is and where areas of opportunity are. Last questions. From like students? <laughs> Charlie's kind of shrugging. Do you have a question, Charlie? Okay. All right. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you.